players like Raymond Keane, who's a grandmaster, Tony Miles, who was England's first ever grandmaster, Jonathan Spielman, also all these players from England made this opening a very popular choice. And it's a very exciting and aggressive way of meeting D4. Um, now, the basic idea, the basic setup you're going for with black is e6, b6, and bishop to b7. And this is what we call a hyper-modern opening, as Nimzovich uh, coined in his uh, book, My System, I believe. It's where black aims to attack the center from the side. So you set up and you aim to hit away at white center from the side of the board. And it gets some very interesting and dynamic positions of reaching this. So it's this opening that will suit you if you wanna get to white out of the main opening books, but play in an interesting and aggressive fashion. So obviously it suits me because this is the way I play. Now I should also mention before we go on to this, that after the moves D4, I'm really, we are now going to enter the fabulous and interesting world of the English defence. Now, this is an opening which I have, I'm have i very fond of and I have very fond memories of. It's an opening that is generally played from the black perspective against either the D-pawn or the C-pawn starting on move one. So the Queen's pawn opening or the English opening. And it's called the English defence for a reason. It was made popular by a number of English players, maybe even in the 70s, possibly 70s, 80s. Players like Raymond Keane, who's as Nimzovich uh, coined in his uh, book, My System, I believe, is where black aims to attack the center from the side. So you set up and you aim to hit away at white center from the side of the board. And it gets some very interesting and dynamic positions of reaching this. So it's this opening that will suit you if you want to get white out of the main opening books, but play in an interesting and aggressive fashion. So obviously it suits me because this is the way I play. Now, I should also mention before we go on to this, that after the moves D4, I'm really, Tony Miles was the main person who made this opening popular. And today it is the 23rd of April 2015, and Tony Miles unfortunately passed away, Britain's first ever grandmaster at a too young an age. And if he was still alive, he would be 60 years old today. Tony Miles, great player. Tony Miles once famously beat Karpov with the black pieces after Karpov played D4. Tony Miles played A6, the cheek of him. And he went on to defeat Karpov with this ridiculous move, A6. He was a legendary player, so I think it's appropriate to mention that here. And I'm glad to be filming his opening on uh, his 60th birthday, what would have been his 60th birthday. So the general idea after the move D4 and C4 is to continue with either E6 or B6. Now, my, my rule would be if, if white plays the English, then you should play B6 immediately. This is the way I play this opening. If white plays d4, I always play e6 immediately. Now, the reason for this is I don't believe that black gets a particularly great position after b6, e4 here. I don't like this setup um, from the black perspective. I think white is better here. Now, against c4 and then b6, it's not, not as bad now. This this is okay because white can't get two pawns in the center. And if he goes e4, it's a different game altogether. And we'll have a look at that later on in this series of DVDs. Now, the only thing you need to know is that after d4, e6, white, of course, has the possibility to play e4 here. Therefore, trying to force you into a French defense with d5. So... I must warn you, in order to play the English defence, you should have some understanding of the French defence. And this is why in the future I'm going to do a series on the French defence from the black perspective. So really, in 10 videos time, I've got five videos on the English defence, five videos on the French defence, an opening I've always played. You'll be able to have a repertoire from the black perspective against every option white will play. But one thing you will find quite often is that after the move D4, White will never really want to play an e4 opening. He wants to play a c4 opening. And the critical move here, in my opinion, is the move c4. 
and this is what you will face most of the time. Now, the English defense proper, d4, e6, c4, we play b6. And what this video is mainly going to be concentrating on is the following variation. e4, so white gets this very big center, bishop to b7, immediately attacking the center. Now, you can get this via, via the move order knight to c3, bishop to b7, e4. You get the same thing here, so it doesn't really matter the move order. But the idea in this position, so we have to keep attacking white center. White has just moved the knight to defend e4. The whole idea of this opening is to attack white center. How do we go about doing this? Can you develop a piece and attack the center? Well, knight to f6 wouldn't be correct because white can attack that and go e5. A much better way of doing this is by playing the move bishop to b4. And this is a great way to strike out. Again, bishop takes e4 is the threat, winning a pawn for absolutely nothing. So how should white deal with this threat? Well, in the next video after this, we will concentrate on the move bishop to d3, which looks very logical. In this video, we are concentrating on the move f3. Now, one thing I should make very clear here, in this whole opening, black's strategy, the setup, you need to play as black. First of all, you put your bishop on b7, you attack e4. Then nearly always, you move your bishop to b4. So there you're stage one, bishop to b7. Stage two, bishop to b4. Stage three, then, is nearly always the move f5. This is like your lever. So imagine this is your crowbar as such. You need to open up the position, open up white center, crack open the safe in the middle of the board, white's pawn center. And you can do this by the crowbar move, pawn to f5. And this really aims to just attack the center of the board. And in the English defense, the move f5 is a move you really need to rely on. So remember, this is an important move throughout this series on the English defense. So how should white deal with this move? Well, he should really normally do something with the e pawn. And the most critical move is what happens if he takes on f5. Well, you might imagine here that black should simply take back on f5. Well, no, not in the English defense. The English defense has many more in interesting ideas than this. And here we have an amazing idea, first thought up actually by Tony Miles. And that idea is knight to h6. This may look crazy at first glance, but we're going for quick developments. We have three pieces developed. This is a pawn sacrificed line. But our general idea here is to bring our knight into f5, where queen to h4 check will become a serious a nuisance for white. We're also getting ready to castle quickly, get our rook on the f file. And all these moves are coming together very nicely. Now, it may look at first glance again that white can simply take on h6 with his bishop when pawn takes bishop would leave black in a rather ugly position. But against this move, black has the intermezzo move, queen to h4 check. And after g3, we can take on h6 with our queen. And surprisingly enough here, black has very good play on the dark squares with the queen coming into e3. We're threatening to win our pawn back. And if white gets greedy here by taking on e6, one of the only ways he can try to save the pawn, well, here, here we come, straight into the position, queen to e3 check. And after a move like bishop to e2, we can take on c3 check. And after king to f2, we don't even have to recapture the pawn on e6. We can even just castle with numerous threats building on the f3 square. So this shows you so many ideas involved with this f4 crowbar move. In this, in this line, f5, should I say, f5 crowbar move, f4 comes in some positions. So let's just go back through this again, because it's probably the first time you've seen this opening. So we play this opening. So in the game, our main game here, it's Hans Rudy versus Morozevich. The game started c4, Morozevich played b6. Hans Rudy played d4, bishop to b7, knight to c3, and e6. And this is your first kind of setup in this line. And remember, I would only recommend you go against this setup when white has a pawn on c4. 
So you can do this by the move order we demonstrated earlier. And then when white grabs the center, we go for stage two, we pin the knight on c3. And then when white defends the center, we use the crowbar move, stage three, f5. And here, if white takes on f5, we have this lovely idea, knight to h6. And let's just show you some other variations here. I mean, the game Morozevich played continued pawn takes e6. Well, again, we're going for quick development. What is one of the main ideas behind knight to h6? Knight to f5, bringing that piece straight into the position. Queen to h4 check is an idea. White, we're happy if white takes another pawn because if white does take on d7, we will go knight takes d7. And even though we're two pawns down, we have four pieces developed. We have horrible threats, a queen to h4 check. We're ready to castle and get a rook to the e file. This is such a dangerous position for white and black has a ginormous attack here a brilliant attack for example let's say white plays move like knight to e2 well we simply castle and then we can start attacking now that we have every piece developed and our king safe remember when you um, aim to attack your opponent's king you need to take a lot of factors into control so you need to think do i have good piece developments do i have good safe king is my opponent compromised in some way? So yes, my opponent's king is in the middle here. Yes, my opponent's development is bad because his bishop f1 is still here. So it is time to attack here. And another useful move in this f3 line is nearly always the move queen to h4 check. And this aims to force white to play g3. And then he has weakened the f3 square. So our queen could just simply come back to a square like e7. And again, the rook coming to e8. Beautiful attacking position here. Very good for black. So this is the general idea of this lovely pawn sack line. It's one of my favorite ideas in, in any opening, actually. This idea of playing the crowbar move f5. White takes on f5 and then going knight to h6. Now, remember, this only works, this idea of knight to h6 to f5 in this position because white has played f3. Therefore, he can't develop his knight easily to f3, and we have this added option of queen to h4 check. So how did Morozevich's game go? Well, white took on e6. We continued with knight to f5. I say we, I meant Morozevich, but hopefully it will be us at some point. And now... His opponent, Hans Reet, decided to try and get developed quickly with knight on g to e2, rather than being greedy and taking on d7. And now Morozevich was happy just to continue his development, offering again this pawn on d7 because he would gain tempo by developing castles. One of the main ideas now is going to be queen to h4 check, as we've seen. Queen to b3 was now played. And now... It's time to attack and open up lines. Remember, when your king, it's, opponent's king is in the middle of the board, you need to open up lines. You need to attack and keep the initiative. So Morozevich now played the move c5, another great move in this position, defending the bishop and chipping away at white center. Try to think if you're white in this position, what move could you play as white? It's really such a hard position to play with the white pieces and so easy for black to play. White has to proceed with great care. Um, in the game, Hansri took on d7. Again, we've seen this idea before. Morozevich simply took back with a knight. Yes, black is two pawns down, but look at black's development. Every piece has a smile on its face. It's a sunny day for every black piece. It's a sunny day for the black king. We have rooks coming into the middle of the board, queens coming over check, things happening on d4. And the game finished... Pawn to d5. And now look at this knight. Knight to e5. That knight comes racing into the position. Lovely dominating black knights there. Knight to f4 was played from white. But now queen to h4 check was played. King to d1. The other idea in these positions is white will struggle to play g3 because then... Because we have our knight on f5, we can often go knight takes g3 and the rook is going to be taken next move. That's why white had to play king to d1. And now look at the magic of these black knights. Knight to d4. White queen only has one square to move to. 
And now crash. It's time to crash through. Rook takes f4. White only has one try, g3. But now queen to h5. The white king is far too exposed. Bishop takes f4. Queen came into f3 check. And now Morozevich simply took the rook on h1. And he went on to win this game in some style. So again, I think that shows you some of the lovely ideas involved with this variation and some of the key ideas with this f3 move, which we're mainly concentrating on here. So let's just again go through some other possibilities here. So after d4, I recommend you go e6. Remember this move order, because if you had played b6, our opponent can go e4. And I only want to play b6 when white goes c4. So that's a rule. In this system, in the English defence, you go b6 when white plays c4. So this is rule. b6 when white plays c4. Remember that rule and you'll get the positions we're going to discuss here. For example, after a move like c4, b6. And now knight to c3 was the last line we looked at. What if white plays e4 immediately? Does it make any difference? Well, not really. Stage one, get our bishop to b7, attacking the center from afar. And then, well, we know what happens if knight to c3. If the knight goes to c3, our bishop comes to b4. Can white avoid this in any other ways? Well, another video in two in this series will look at the move bishop to d3. And we also will look at the move d5 in another video, trying to block the center immediately. If f3 straight away, does this make any difference? No. What plan do we do against f3? Remember the crowbar move. I mean, we could go bishop to b4 check here straight away, trying to get back into the positions we know. But remember the crowbar move? What's the crowbar move in these positions? We can actually do that crowbar move now. F5, like a crowbar, trying to open up white centre, this hyper-modern idea of attacking the centre from afar. And now, what happens when white takes on F5? What's our main idea here? Yes, knight to H6. Hopefully you remember that idea. Point being, if white takes on H6, we have queen to H4 check, gaining the dark squares. And if white takes on E6, our knight comes into F5, with this big initiative. Another game which ended very briefly here was between two very strong players. So I believe they're both FIDE Masters, 2300 ELO rating, and this game ended in 12 moves. Again, showing you how dangerous its opening can be for white. And that game continued bishop to d3, allowing queen to h4 check, king to f1, and here, well, you could go knight to g3 check, but the idea that white had was that if you play this, white was willing to sacrifice the exchange and go queen to e2 when white gains a slight attack himself here. So we're the person, black is the person that's attacking. I don't want to give our opponent any fun. Why should we allow white to have any fun? We're the one who should be having all the fun. So let's, let's not allow white to gain initiative like this. And actually in the game, black played knight takes d4 instead. And... The knight is very well placed in the central square. We are ready to bring our other knight to c6 and to castle queenside even. That game now continued. Bishop to e4, a big mistake. Can you see what black's best plan is? Well, bishop takes e4 is correct first. And after queen takes d4, what should black play here? Pause the video if you want to think about black's best move in this, in this particular position. Black has one move that gains him a winning advantage here. Can you find that move? Bishop to c5. Beautiful idea. If queen takes bishop, queen to f2 is mate. And white threw in a check on d7. We've seen this before. We can take on d7, but black even just moved his king to f7 here, keeping the threat against the queen. And after queen to d2, another question here for you guys watching this video Black to play and force checkmate in two moves. How does he do that? I'm not even going to show you the move. Pause the video if you want to find the move. Only one more line we really need to look at in this video, and that is the following variation. That is with d4, e6, c4. Remember the rule, when white plays c4, only then do we play b6. And now let's say he goes e4, stage one done, the hypermodern attacking of the e4 square. 
knight to c3, stage two, we attack the center with bishop to b4. And then what's the state? What's the next stage? What's the crowbar move? F5, of course, very nice move. So what happens if white tries to push on with pawn to e5? How should we deal with this move? Well, now, in my opinion, the best way of dealing with this move now is to try to get castled queenside as quickly as possible. So we have to move the knight on b8, the queen on d8, and then we want to castle queenside, and then we want to attack white's pawn center by the move d6. So, for example, knight to c6 here. And white can try and move like f4, trying to consolidate the center, but a very, very ambitious move from black now queen to h4 check the point of this as we've seen before is try to force white to play the move g3 when our bishop on b7 becomes an extremely dangerous piece white really has to play g3 here and now our queen comes back to e7 so see how this clever check move rather than going queen e7 first has gained some kind of edge for black in this position because now we're threatening knight takes d4 and after a plan like bishop to g2 we can castle queenside and go d6 next with a very nice position. For example, knight to f3, d6. We're ready to break with d takes e5, opening up the rook, pressurizing d4. You'll notice that in all these lines we've mentioned in this video, that black's idea is this hypermodern idea. And black's idea in all these videos is to attack white's pawn formation of e4, c4, and d4 from the side with this fianchetto bishop on b7. So this is the idea. Remember this idea, and you need to leave her with f5 in a lot of positions. Now, why do I only suggest you go b6 against c4? The reason is because I think it's important for us to have this bishop b4 check. And if you played sort of b6 in this position against the move e4, we are. It doesn't make any sense for us to go bishop b4 check, for example, something like bishop to d3, bishop to b7, and now knight to f3. Well, we don't have the bishop b4 check because white can play c3 and kick our bishop away. If white's pawn was already on c4, he doesn't have the possibility of going c3 anymore. So the check is a very good possibility for us. So that's why the rule is, from black's perspective, we wait until c4 to go b6. But then I think the idea shown in this video will give you a nice basis for what the English defence is. And we should honour this in the great memory of Tony Miles. And it's a very aggressive opening. In the next video, I will show you another strategy that white can adopt, but again, black gets great play. So hopefully you're brave enough to give this English defence a go. Um, and good luck if you do. I, I praise your braviness. Braviness? Not sure that's a word, but um, your courage. That's a better word. There we go. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. If you're interested in this opening, stay tuned to the next, I believe, four videos in this series. We are now going to enter the fabulous and interesting world of the English This is the second video.
She burns the bridges in my head by lighting up a fire Bury my old thoughts instead so you can feel the same I lay alone with you inside my mind We would dance the night away to the morning light short series on the English defense and we're going to look at another setup that white can adopt in this series against this very aggressive idea from black this hyper modern way of attacking the center from the side it's been coined this opening in English defense as we discussed because lots of strong grandmasters from England in the 70s started developing this opening mainly Tony Miles and Raymond Keane but as we're going to see from this game you can see by the names of the players even ex-world champion Boris Spassky has been brave enough to play this opening. So it's got a good record of ambitious, dynamic players playing this strategy. And Spassky was a really, in my opinion, underrated world champion. He had a very exciting, exciting way of playing chess. He famously never lost a game in the King's Gambit, another opening I really enjoy. And he liked playing uncompromising chess where he gained the initiative and could attack his opponents. So this opening, the English defence, is a perfect opening for him. His opponent here is the player Ajor Jan. And Ajor Jan actually was famous for saying black is OK. He was a big believer that black was OK in the opening. But... He got absolutely smashed in this game. So as well as having a look at this game, we're also going to study, I would say, more the theory on another setup from White. So what is that setup? Well, after the move C4, remember the rule I said in the first video, when your opponent plays C4, you are able to play the move B6. That even includes move 1. Now, the other move order that we could use to reach this is D4. Here, I nearly always play the move e6, and in this position, if c4, well, the rule again, once c4 is played and played, b6 is a good option. So, c4, b6, d4, bishop b7, knight to c3, e6, and this is our starting formation. And now, when white is brave enough to accept the challenge and gain this big center, this is where it gets really fun. What do we do now? 
Well, hopefully you have watched the first video and you're well accustomed to the ideas. Bishop to b4. In the first video, we concentrated on f3, trying to keep a nice solid formation. But we saw just how black can aim to destroy that pawn formation. And the question is, what else can white play here? Well, one of the most common moves is the developing move bishop to d3, defending the pawn on e4, and obviously developing a piece. White would love to be able to play knight to f3 and castle when he's nice and safe and his center remains intact. But things are never so easy in the English defense. In the English defense, we always keep the pressure up against our opponents. So already in this, I would say, quite theoretical position, can you think what move black should be playing here? From the first video, remember this crowbar move, the crowbar, the lever move. What is the lever move? It is the move F5. And look at this very sneaky little bishop on B7. Well, if white takes on F5, which he has done before, white has, been, has taken this move. Well, this is just clearly an error. In some positions, white can take this pawn, but as a rule, only when black's dark square bishop is still on f8. Because if white takes on f5 here, we just take on g2, and white can say a goodbye to the rook on h1. There was one game where white now continued queen to h5 check, and now we see the reason why white cannot do this line when the bishop is no longer on f8. It means the black king can quite safely move to f8. And as long as you're careful here with black, you will win the rook and you will be a rook up. Um, you can go knight to f6 soon and just take on h1. And you should win this game. You're an extra rook.
Yes, your king is a little bit misplaced, but it's not worth a whole rook. No, by no means at all. So f5 is a nice way of playing, and we're trying to just put the pressure on this pawn. So how can white deal with his threats? Because given a chance, we will take on e4 next move. Well, white has also tried to move like queen to c2 here. And this is giving extra protection to the e4 pawn. But black can now logically just increase the pressure on e4 with nice, easy developing moves. And what is a more natural move in this position than knight to f6? The point being, again, if white tries to move the e pawn, even e5, black simply takes on b g2. And after white captures the knight, we don't even have to take the rook immediately. We can take back on f6 first, and we're going to win the rook next move with a winning position because we're going to be exchanging two pawns up. So after the move knight to f6, there was again Van Pabion versus Spielman, Jonathan Spielman. Um, once one of the top four players, I think he got to the semi-final of the World Championships once, Spielman from England, a very imaginative player. And that game continued pawn to d5, trying to block out the centre, but now Spielman just played pawn takes e4. White can't take capture with a pinned knight on c3, so bishop takes e4, and here black simply took on d5. And because of the pin on the knight, black has already won a pawn, and he's ready to castle and get a rook to e8 very quickly. So it's been a complete success, this opening. So therefore, queen to c2, does not even work in this position, defending the pawn in that manner. So what else can be tried? How about queen to e2? Well, that is a much better idea because now after the move knight to f6, it means here that actually, well, the queen is slightly better, better placed on e2 because, you know, it keeps control of the e-file. There's some ideas of white taking on f5 and it keeps the queen in a more central position. So it's slightly better positioned here. Um, so how should white continue? Because yet again, with a move knight to f6, you have just increased the pressure against e4. Given a chance, your next move will be to go pawn takes e4, winning a pawn. And one of the reasons I really like this opening, and this is one thing you've got to think about if you get in this position where white gains the big center and you can attack the center, you really, every move, you chip away at the center and white has to defend so every move you chip away white defends you chip away white defense so it's it's you as the black pieces who is putting the pressure on your opponent at such an early stage which i think is a lovely position to be in now generally after the move knight to f6 white has two ways to defend either with f3 or with bishop to g5 and your setup against both of these moves is very easy to play. I mean, let's just take them one at a time. Bishop to g5 tries to defend the pawn on e4 by creating a pin on the knight on f6. And against this move, a very simple way of playing is to just take on e4. And after bishop takes e4, simply to go bishop takes e4 ourselves. Now, if you're in a really crazy mood, I mean, let, let's say, I don't know, you're, you're just feeling a little bit crazy, a little bit nuts, a little bit insane. Maybe you had a, maybe you've been drinking some whiskey during this game, which I don't recommend. Not something I've ever tried. Well, not often. Uh, but if you're in a really crazy mood, you're up for some entertainment and you're just uh, fancy a change of scenes. Well, if you want to, you can sacrifice your queen here when knight takes e4. And after bishop takes d8, knight takes c3. And this just becomes insane. This is insanity chess. Um, now, you don't have to play this way as black. A much better way to play after bishop takes e4. Well, I don't know about better, but a safer way to play. And a theme we're going to see in a couple of variations here is just to take on e4 of your bishop. And after bishop takes f6, white has to play this move because the knight was defending the bishop. Queen takes f6. Queen takes e4, only move for white. We can now, first of all, double white's pawns. Useful move to play. And now play knight to c6. 
and after knight to f3, just simply castle here. And black, I would say, has a slight advantage because of white's double pawns. Your aim is to try to swap off the queens at some point when the ending's going to be good for you. And how do you target these double pawns? Well, once the queens are swapped off, I think the most common way of doing this is with the move knight to a5. Don't forget about this plan. Knight to a5 targets the c4 pawn. On the other hand, black has a very solid position, so it's a very comfortable way to play this. So that's that's my recommended way of playing in this position if white defends with queen e2 and bishop g5. What about f3? Well, against the move f3, we now should keep chipping away at pawns that we can attack whilst developing. How do we do that? Well, now the d4 pawn becomes a bit of a target because white can no longer play knight to f3 defending that pawn. So knight to c6. And, well, if the white pawn goes forwards, really white is, is over overextending himself. The knight can either come to d4 or even to e5, a great play. So white generally tries to defend this with bishop to e3. And now a very nice sequence of events here. What you should do in this kind of structure is first take on e4, because now we have the open f file for our rook once we castle. And after white plays pawn takes e4, the very important move gaining the space e5. Because we have great development, we are attacking the center very quickly. Point being, if white attacks your knight now with d5, our knight comes into d4. And we have a nice advantage in this position. So they're your general ideas against queen to e2. It's actually been found after your lever moves. So let's just go through the moves again very quickly. So we have the opening c4. When white plays c4, we go b6. And then we get our setup with e6. If white is brave enough to go e4, we pin the knight. And now bishop to d3, we use our lever, f5. And now we've looked at a number of options. What else can white play here? Well, we'll look at queen to h5 check, which is maybe the main move very soon. But that's similar to queen to e2. I mean, d5 is another way white can play when he's trying to block out your bishop on b7. This is quite a logical move, but here we see an idea, another Tony Miles idea, and that is it's, it's important not to play too passively here because if you play too passively in this position, you will find that your bishop on b7 is going to become a dead piece of wood on the board. It's not going to have any effect on the game. So you've got to play actively here. And one of the things I'll always say if you're brave enough to play this opening is to keep remembering to play active. You have to find active, active ideas. And the most active idea here is to take on e4, forcing really bishop takes e4, and now a lovely move, the main move here, that's a really strange move, queen to h4. How many times do you get to play the move queen to h4 in a main line opening at such an early stage? Very crafty move. The idea is to go queen takes bishop, check, if the white bishop goes to f3, we take the pawn on c4, and we're just increasing the pressure on white center. Now, there was a game where Boris Gukol, who has done some great videos on chess.com as well, played this as black. So again, it shows you some of the quality of the players who play this. And that went queen to e2. And now black again increases the pressure. Every move you play should be creating a threat against the center or pieces in the center. Knight to f6 renewing the threat to take the bishop. Bishop has to move, and now Gukul simply castled with the idea of trying to get his rook to the e-file very quickly. Pawn takes e6, and now rather than do something like bishop takes bishop, which could be a mistake, quick development is key. Lovely move here, knight to c6. Lovely, lovely move. Idea of the knight coming to d4. Remember, in the English defense, do not be afraid to sacrifice pawns. Give those pawns away if it means you get quick developments. Couple more moves, g3, queen to d4, bishop to d2, and now bishop to a6. The bishop has done its job in this diagonal, so it transfers to a better square. c4 cannot be defended. And after pawn takes d7, bishop takes c4, queen e3, queen takes d7. Black is virtually winning here already with all his pieces playing a part. 
all the pieces coming into the game and it didn't take long for Gukol to win this game. Right, now we're going to have a look at how Spassky dealt with this uh, opening um, with the black side. And this is very similar to a line we looked at before. And what happened was Bishop d3, we now use the lever move, or Spassky did, should I say, f5. We should be doing the same. And here his opponent played what is considered the main option here, queen to h5 check. And after queen to h5 check, Spassky played g6. Now the queen came back to e2. So you might be thinking, what does this achieve, this queen to h5 check? Well, it's very similar to the queen e2 we looked at, yet white is figuring that by forcing black to play g6, he has created some weaknesses on these dark squares, which I've highlighted here on the king side. So that, that's the idea of, of his plan. But if you can remember the strategy used against queen e2, you use exactly the same strategy against queen h5 check. Keep attacking the center. Remember, attack the center. If your opponent defends, attack something else. Keep chipping away at your opponent's center. Knight to f6, attacking e4. And now, if bishop to g5, well, we looked at what we should do here. We simply take on e4 when we can sacrifice the queen or play in a more positional manner. The choice is yours. Spassky's opponent instead played f3. Remember now, what do we do? We develop and attack another pawn now. In the English defence, we are normally attacking this e4 figurehead, but sometimes we can change to attacking the d4 pawn as well. And we can do that here, knight to c6. And against bishop to e3, well, again, I'm testing you as we go along. What was the plan you use in this structure? What do you do here? Remember, you, you've got to, you've played all your aggressive moves now. You don't want to be too cramped. You might need to strike with one of your pawns. The correct move here is to take once on e4, opening up the f-file, and then after pawn takes e4, e5. This is the correct way to strike, and you get a very nice position by playing in that way. And after, after uh, in the game, well, here, white played the move e5, which led him into a lot of trouble because Spassky now played knight takes d4. Very amusing variation, this. Well, for Spassky, at least, not for his opponent, who's a very strong grandmaster. Queen to f2. I think at this point, um, white was thinking, great, I'm playing the world champion Spassky. I'm attacking two pieces. There's knight on f6, there's knight on d4. I'm going to win a piece. I'm going to win the game against world champion. But all of a sudden, after knight to h5, queen to takes d4, white must have been horribly shot by bishop to c5. And look at this queen. This queen is rather embarrassed. It's stuck in the middle of the board with no places to run to. Very funny way to trap the white queen. That white queen is trapped. And of course, Black went on to win the game because he's won the white queen. So that really sums up all the theoretical um, aspects of this variation. And I'd say the main starting point for this variation is here after e4. Now, of course, white doesn't have to play the move e4. He can refrain from playing this move. And we'll look at some setups you can try there in another video. So that's important to know. To start with, though, I think it is critical to look at this setup where white puts all his pawns in the center. Clearly a critical option. Remember, if your opponent does this, you use both your bishops, and then you rely on the maneuver f5. And that is true against f3 and bishop to d3. Against both of these moves, you play f5. Now, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun if you play this variation as black. Um, I've had probably this opening in the classical Dutch, I've had the most fun with throughout my chess career as openings. They've been the openings I've maybe fallen in love with a little bit the most. And hopefully you will do the same if you give this opening a go. I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun at the least. And hopefully the odd victory as well. Welcome to this third video in the series of the English Defence. And we're going to look at probably the most critical setup that White can play in this uh, short video we're doing. And this video will hopefully um, cover you 
totally for White's move Bishop D3, which we'll come on to next. And after this video and the following two videos, you will have a great repertoire to play against one D4. Well, that's that's the idea anyway. So um, let's see. Let's see. OK, so we're looking at this obviously from black point of view. And after the move D4, our move order is to start with E6. And if you can remember the rule from the previous two videos, my basic rule was you only play the move B6 when white goes C4. So when white plays C4, you play B6 to get into the English defence. Now, I also noted in those videos, in the move order we're using here, you do have to be paired to enter a French defence with if white plays E4 here, which I have to say, if, if white goes 1D4, it's quite rare they're going to want to all of a sudden then play a king's pawn opening. It's much more likely that they'll do another move here. Um, and we will look at alternatives to c4 in the fifth video in this series. So ways that you might be tricked out somewhat. And I'll give you some recommendations then. But we're now going to look at the most critical variation. And that is with c4 and the rule. White plays c4. So we now go b6 this hypermodern English defence where we attack the centre from the side. So remember, plan one, get our bishop to b7 and attack the centre from the side with that bishop. Plan two normally is bishop to b4 check or bishop to b4 pinning the knight on c3. And then often in the English defence, the main move we rely on is plan three, the crowbar f5. So remember these ideas. And these ideas work especially well when your opponent tries to take over the centre with the move e4. And this is what we're going to look at now. And really, these videos are mainly aimed against this setup where white gains a strong centre. Other setups, not so critical. Now, OK, so we play plan one here. We attack the centre from the side, bishop to b7. And here, in this video, we're concentrating on bishop to d3. Now, this move, theoretically speaking, is considered to be white's best option at this moment in time. Now, why is this superior, maybe, to the other options we've looked at, knight to c3 and f3? Well, the thing is, after bishop to d3, if black plays bishop to b4 check, which is actually my main recommendation, white does not have to respond with knight to c3. So in these variations, white doesn't have to allow the white knight to be pinned on c3. There are other ways to block the bishop to b4 check, mainly by bishop to d2. So that is the first reason why uh, this bishop move is quite a nice move. The other reason is, well, the natural move here would be the crowbar move f5, but I suggest you do not play this move in this position. I don't think it's the correct way to play. Stick with plan two, which was bishop to b4 check, which we'll come on to shortly. Just to mention why I don't think f5 is a good move, it now gives white the option of playing e takes f5. And this is an extremely dangerous move to face. Now, it may look like, oh, you can win the pawn on g2, happy days. But the problem is, if you go grabbing this pawn on g2 with bishop takes g2, your king will be under extreme fire with the move queen to h5 check. Look at this poor little guy on e8. He's under pressure already. And unlike some of the other variations, the black king can no longer go to f8. And this is a very risky position. Theoretically, I wouldn't recommend you play this from black. Even if you win a rook, it doesn't matter if you get checkmated. So that is the problem with this line. Um, and the other thing worth mentioning is if you try bishop to b4 check here, well, this used to be a very playable move. Because now white has to be very careful. Because if white played a, a funny move like knight to c3, well, this is now clearly a blunder. Because now you can take on g2. And the difference after queen to h5 check is that your king has the f8 square. So king to f8. And you will win the rook on h1. And your king is not under so much danger here. But the problem is, after bishop to b4 check, it was then found 
that white can play the rather strange looking move king to f1. But this move works very well here because the king defends the pawn on g2 and white has won a pawn on f5. So this is why the crowbar move after bishop to d3, the crowbar f5 move does not work. My recommendation here is to play bishop to b4 check. And this also fits in quite well with our plan of going bishop to b7 first, bishop to b4 next, and then sometimes f5. But we don't always play the crowbar in this particular variation. Now, the move knight to c3 here would lead back into the previous video, because then we can play the crowbar f5, so we don't need to concern ourselves about that move. King to f1 is actually a move which is not so crazy after bishop to b4 check. So bishop to b4 check here, and now the move king to f1 is not ridiculous here. Both sides have gained something. Black has forced the white king to move, but now white is also trying to prove that bishop on b4 is not so well placed, and it could be exposed and white has a space advantage. Now, the way I play against this, and I have played, is a ridiculous looking move, but in actual sense, it makes some logical sense. I've always played the ridiculous looking move, bishop back to f8. Now, you may be thinking, he's gone crazy, uh, um, he's cracked, he's eventually cracked. The ginger GM has eventually cracked and he's lost his mind. Now, don't worry, it's not the first time someone said that, but this kind of makes some sense. What I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to get into what we call a hippopotamus setup. And the setup I'm going for is called the hippopotamus because it's supposed to look like a hippopotamus. Now, not seeing too many hippopotamuses in the streets of London, I'm not so sure if it actually looks like a hippopotamus. That could be a song. Not seeing a hippopotamus in the streets of London. That sounds like a great lyrics to a song. But anyway, I digress. But the hippopotamus is basically where we go g6, bishop g7, d6, knight d7, knight e7. And I had one game in this line, which continued as such, knight to c3, g6. So I went for my hippopotamus setup, white develops as well. And now I got my hippopotamus moves in, I kicked this bishop away, I went d6. And the good thing about this compared to a normal hippopotamus is that white's king is on f1 and it probably does not want to be on f1. And here I continued with sensible moves and I quickly got a very good game. So you can go for this hippopotamus setup if you want to be a bit weird and wacky with bishop to f8. There is another option if you didn't quite like the look of that. And the other option here is the move e5, um, going for a pawn sacrifice line. And the reason we're sacrificing a pawn is because our opponent's king is misplaced. We can maybe afford to do this. And there was one grandmaster game which continued pawn takes pawn, and now d6. And I think at club level, international master level, even IM level, this would be a very effective way to play. The point being, after some like a3, bishop c5, pawn takes d6, maybe bishop takes d6 here, Knight c3, knight c6. Black is only a pawn down, but black can try to castle queenside quickly. You have a knight coming to e5, and white's king will never be able to castle. So this seems like great initiative to me. So that's the more aggressive way of playing. Anyway, back to bishop b4 check. I think I'll be very surprised if your opponent plays king to f1 here. It's really quite a high highly fought after move. And it's it's kind of one that you'd only see at top, top level. A much more natural way to play is bishop to d2. And this is one of the reasons white plays the bishop to d3. Now, we haven't got the pin on the knight on c3, but our plan now will continue with bishop takes d2. Black is slightly more cramped. And when you're slightly more cramped in chess, a rule you should remember is the exchanges of pieces help you out because it means your pieces that remain won't con come congested. They won't get in the way of each other as much. And after this bishop takes d2 move, white has two options, two sensible options. Queen takes d2 or knight takes d2. Now, we'll have a look at these one by one. I would consider the move knight takes d2 to be the main move because this reinforces 
the pawn on e4. Now, if white plays queen takes d2, we can now come back to our crowbar move because at the moment, the pawn on e4 is not particularly well guarded. Um, I wouldn't recommend you play this against knight takes d2, but only against queen takes d2 because white hasn't moved a piece into the game to defend e4. So what is the crowbar move? If you been watching these videos, you should really know this move by now. F5. And here, again, white's e4 pawn is under pressure. White can't move that pawn because we take on g2. And if white tries to guard the center with knight to c3, we increase the pressure against e4. How do we do this? Knight to f6. And here, well, there was one game that continued queen to e2, trying to guard the points on e4. If f3, I would recommend you continue in similar fashion to what we looked at in a previous video, where as soon as our opponent plays f3, we finish our development and we actually aim to target the other central pawn. And if you watch the previous videos in this um, series, you will see that normally the correct move here is knight to c6. And this leads to positions we should be accustomed to. Now, very interesting game. Did continue queen to e2 here. Black simply castled, knight to f3, and now black took on e4 and went knight to c6. And after a3, knight to a5. This is a very clever move because now one of the threats is to take on e4 twice when c4 won't be defended. And after rook to c1, defending c4, black attacked quickly when knight takes e4, bishop takes e4, and now the tactical blow. Bishop takes e4, queen takes e4, knight takes c4. And I'll let you work this out at home if you want to, but the idea is to go d5, next move, and even though white can take the check on e6, there's a rook to e8 coming. So if you want to pause the video at any point during this, just pause it to look at the position a little bit deeper because I do tend to go through these videos quite quickly and cram in as much information as I can. Um, so... That is my recommended move after the sequence. If we just go back, bishop to d3, bishop to b4 check, bishop d2, the most logical move. We swap off on d2. And now if white doesn't reinforce the e4 square with knight takes d2, but plays queen takes d2, we can crowbar with f5. Now, if white plays knight takes d2, our game plan slightly changes here because it wouldn't make as much sense now to attack the e4 pawn because when we go to attack it with a move like f5, we're not actually threatening to take on e4. And a little rule to remember in English defence is whenever you play the crowbar move f5, you really should be creating the threat of winning the pawn on e4. So the crowbar move e4 works a lot better when you're considering and threatening to take on e4 winning a pawn. And that doesn't work in this position. Now here, what we should do now, because white's knight on d2 is not ideally placed, it'd much rather be on the c3 square. The way I enjoy playing this position is by now attacking the d4 pawn. And I've always played knight to c6 here, which I think is a very nice idea. Now, the idea behind this, so we, we are bringing another strategy into play we haven't seen yet. The idea is to attack d4. Now, if white ever pushes forwards with the move d5, we try to control all of these kind of weakened dark squares that I've just highlighted in the center of the board. So we plonk our knight into e5, a lovely square for the knight, and when the bishop moves, we want to maybe control the f4 square, so we can even play a move like g5 here. And this
actually positionally very well founded we want to keep the e5 squares an outpost for our knight and stop the move f4 and here we want to go something like queen f6 making our control over the dark squares even greater and then we can even castle queen side so let's just have a look at some examples of these ideas and actions so when your opponent takes on d2 with the knight we go for dark square control in the center and pressure against d4 now, White generally defends this pawn and develops his knights. Now, there was one game where the very two grandmasters playing, the very strong player Eduardo from France, 2650, played this position with Black. And after knight to e2, he continued with his attack of the d4 square. And he played the move queen to f6, a very common idea in this variation. Now, again, if White pushes the d pawn, 
Our knight comes into e5, great control of the dark squares. And if white ever plays e5 in these positions, which he often does, this helps us in a couple of ways. Well, we have to lose tempo by moving our queen, but now our remaining bishop, the bishop on b7, has a great range. It's not blocked in anymore by pawn on e4. And another move we have to remember to play after this e5 move, which we'll see very shortly, is at some point we have to play f6 and try to take on e5, blowing up the center, exploding the center of the board. And our king generally goes queenside. So e5 can be played. In the game in question, white played knight to f3, trying to keep his pawns flexible. And now a very nice move, g5, going for control of the dark squares. e5 was played. The queen came back to g7. White castled and now g4. Knight to d2. And here, a little test for you guys at home. Let's see if you're actually listening to the tips I'm giving you here. What is the one of the main moves you should be playing in this position once white has advanced with e5? What is a great way to explode those pawns in the center? f6. And black got a fantastic position after pawn takes f6, knight takes f6, with castle and queenside later, and then dirty Harry, the h-pawn, Harry, the h-pawn, can roll up the board. So a very promising game there. So let's just have a look at this one more time with knight takes d2. Knight to c6 is now the correct move because you want to attack the dark squares when white sufficiently defends the e4 point. And what about now knight to f3? So we haven't actually looked at this way that white can defend so far. Well, yet again, nearly always a move you rely on in these positions. You have to pressurize the dark squares queen to f6. Now, if white plays d5 here, our knight always comes into the e5 square, trying to take control of those dark squares. And now something like knight takes e5, queen takes e5, queen c2, because the b2 pawn was on pre. And here, I like the move knight to e7. Why? Because I want to control the f4 square, I want to play either g5 and knight g6, really gaining positional control over the f4 square, and this position is fine for black. So the way that white has mainly played here is to advance with e5. And now I've had this maybe four or five times, and I've had a great score in this, in this uh, position. And now I always play the move here, queen to f4. Now I play this move because, again, I'm pressurizing the d4 pawn. And this is one of the strange openings, the English defense, where it actually helps you a number of times to maneuver your queen often around the board because your queen creates a lot of weaknesses. And we're going to see this in the next video. We're going to see some crazy queen maneuvers in the next video. And the idea here, I want to try to make white play g3, which he should play. And now my queen comes back to h6. And why have I made white play to move g3? Think logically. Well, again, it's to do with my bishop on b7. I've made white go e4, weakening the diagonal a little bit, and I've made him go g3, weaken it even more. And the threat in this position here is the immediate knight takes d4. That is the threat. So after white castles, what is that move, that explosion in the center of the board we need to play? f6. And I had a game recently in the Isle of Man Congress, the Poker Stars Isle of Man Congress, in 2014, which continued rook to e1 here. Of course, I castle queenside, a3, and now it's clear I've castled on the queen side, my opponent's castled on the king's side, so it's time to attack. How do we generally attack when both sides castle on the opposite sides of the board? We do the pawn storm, la pawn storm, g5, just as Edward played. And the threat here, again, is to go g4 and take the pawn on d4. My opponent tried to counterattack in the center, but now I cleared up the center of the board. I took on e5. My opponent took on e5. I need to develop my one remaining piece, knight to f6. Knight to e4 was played. I simply took on e4. And now I have a half-open file on the f file. My rook came to that half-open file. And one last question for you guys. My opponent now blundered with rook to e5. 
black to play and get a winning advantage in this position. And you know what? I will leave you with that question whilst we go over the main points of this particular variation. So black to play here and get a winning advantage. I'm not even going to tell you the answer. Pause the video if you haven't got it. And now we'll look at the main points of this bishop to d3 move again. So the English defence, we are really at the moment only considering what happens when white gets his free pawns in the centre. And you know what? You won't get this all the time. I should point out in the English defence, white will try other setups against you. We'll have a look at these in the last video. And here, bishop to b7, bishop to d3, stage two, you check on b4. After bishop d2, you capture on d4. If knight takes, e4 is very well defended. So what target, what pawn do you target? The d4 pawn with ideas knight c6, queen f6, and even g5. If white takes with the queen, well now, the rule I said earlier, if you can use the crowbar f5 and it makes a threat of taking on e4, winning a pawn, it's often the correct way to play. So all in all, that's really everything you need to know for this critical bishop to d3 line to give you a chance of using this very exciting English defence opening. And we now only have two more videos left in this series, and they're hopefully going to be a lot of fun and get you fully equipped to play the English defence. Welcome to the fourth video in this series of playing the English defense uh, against d4 openings from white. And we're going to look at some crazy ideas now. Now, I must warn you, this video should really have um, a rating of about 15. That's not because of any swearing or any rudeness. It's because some of the ideas shown in this video you really shouldn't show kids because it involves the early manoeuvre of Black's queen into the game. And often in the English defence, one of the main ideas is to swing the Black queen at an early stage over to h4. Now, you might be thinking, what on earth is that all about? Why should you bring your queen out early at the start of the game? Well, that's just what happens in the English defence, and it's one of the main ideas. Now, the reason I say you shouldn't show this to kids, it reminds me of a story I've mentioned before when I was teaching kids in school and I was telling them, well, you don't bring your queen out early, you have to bring your knights and bishops out before your queen. And then one of the kids I was teaching went and watched a game of Nakamura's and Nakamura, of course, brought his queen out on move two. And he came back to me a couple of days later, and he said, Sir, 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 Nakamura brought his queen out early, and he's better than you. So I'm like, oh, Nakamura, you just destroyed all of the teaching I've done with these kids. Thank you, Hikaru. So that's why I'm saying it should come with a warning. And in this video, we're going to look at these ideas in the English defence where the queen comes out early, and we're also going to have a look at what happens if white pushes with the d-pawn to d5 quite early in order to block out your bishop on b7. So they're the two main things this video is going to contain. So first of all, let's start with the what I'd say the main setup, d4, e6, c4, and as soon as white plays c4, we go b6. And here, well, we're going to finish our coverage of the move e4 first. So let's just finish this coverage and then we'll come on to the move d5 afterwards, which is a very interesting and sensible move. But first of all, e4 is a move we've been looking at a lot. So let's see what we should do here after bishop b7. And now the last video contained bishop d3. And the other main move is knight to c3. So you should know what you do here. You've done stage one, attack the center. Stage two, you bring your other bishop out. And we looked at most moves here, but the only move we haven't really looked at is queen to c2. Um, another way white can defend the e4 pawn. And this is really the last way that we haven't looked at white can sufficiently defend that e4 pawn. Now, in this example, I believe the best move is to fly our queen out to h4. 
And okay, it's a little bit insane, but it has a lot of good points to it. Number one, you are actually threatening to go queen takes h4, it's queen takes e4, check here. Um, and now that our normal crowbar move f5 is not as strong because the whole point, point of our crowbar move f5 is to normally release our bishop against g2. But here, the pawn on g2 is well defended by the bishop on f1. So our crowbar move loses a lot of its points. The other reason we used our crowbar move is for quick development. But all these don't really work in this position because queen c2 is quite a clever move. But in this position, queen to h4 works surprisingly well. White can't guard the pawn on e4 with f3 because it's pinned. Um, and white really has two choices here. He either tries to block the bishop out with d5 or defends the pawn with bishop to d3. Now, if he goes d5 in this position, I would say a simple solution is simply to take on d5 and then just play either knight to f6 and try to get castled, rook to e8 quickly. Or another thematic move is the move c6 here. And I like c6 because you're trying to open up the centre of the board for your bishop on b7. And these positions should be totally fine for black. Now, if white does not push forwards with d5, but instead tries to play bishop to d3, guarding the pawn on e4, well, now the crowbar move, pawn to f5, is much more effective. Because... The bishop on b7, in some variations, can capture the pawn on g2. And the thing we have to remember about our queen on h4 and these lines, do not get too scared. This queen, if it can't obviously win a pawn on e4 or d4 or c4, the queen will often, in these variations, when attacked, drop back to h5 or g4, if you want to be more sort of going for gold, and then it can come back to f7. So it's actually quite safe queen. I mean, for example, here, white should either play g3 or knight to f3. And after knight to f3, it's now probably the correct moment to capture on c3. Check. I, I like this move here. And after something like queen takes c3, queen to g4 is a very nice move because we're keeping the threats against g2 and pawn takes e4. And again, white's position is becoming overextended in the center. Um, something like castles, we just take on e4. Knight to e5, our queen can even go to h4 now. And it's very safe here. We've won a safe pawn in this position. So in actual fact, this queen h4 idea seems to work very well against queen c2. I mean, bishop to d3, now we use the crowbar. And a typical uh, bad move that white could play here is a move like g3. Yes, it attacks our queen, but it also weakens the diagonal for our English defence bishop on b7. Now the queen can just drop back to h5 or somewhere similar, and after something like bishop e2, even queen to c7. And look at the pressure we are putting on white's pawn on e4. Immense pressure there. So this looks very promising, this whole line for black. And I've gone a little bit more into some variations with this in the PGN notes. So have a look at those if you are if you want to see some of this in a bit more detail. So against queen c2, because our crowbar move doesn't is not as effective here, queen to h4 is an intriguing and very interesting idea here. First used by Tony Miles um, to great effect. And Tony Miles, England's first ever grandmaster, was a really big fan of this queen h4 move, in particular variations. Now, what else can white play here? Well, I think one of the other main moves is d5. And the point behind this is to try to shut out black's bishop on b7. And again, ridiculous looking move, but Tony Miles was a massive fan of playing queen to h4 here. Can you Adam and Eve it? That's actually London rhyming slang uh, for can you believe it? In London, there's something called Cockney rhyming slang. And what you do, you, you rhyme a, a saying with a phrase, and then that's what it is. I probably really confused you there, but um, maybe, maybe you can look that up. Cockney rhyming slang. So can you Adam and Eve it is rhyming with can you believe it? Okay, I'll, I'll get back to the chess now. But queen to h4 
is Tony Miles is very interesting and actually very good idea. You know what? He even played this move and got a good position against Karpov when Karpov was world champion. So it's a kind of move I would love to play in a game of chess. And well, the point is we want to put pressure on c4. Our queen, if attacked in a number of cases, can often drop back to h5. And often our knight on g8 quickly comes f6, e4. Let's just have a look at this in uh, play. Well, in one game, this is a game between Ogard and Tony Miles, white played e3, defending the pawn on c4. And now Tony continued, knight to f6. And another point is if white plays g3, our queen can come to e4. Very annoying for um, white. If the knight ever attacks the queen, well, the queen can come back to h5. Again, quite annoying for white because the queen on h5 even puts pressure on the pawn on d5. So in the game in question, white actually played a3, tried to stop annoying bishop b4 checks. But look at what happens now. Look at the initiative Tony got. Bishop b7, pressurizing d5. White attacked the queen, and the queen simply came back to h5. And now black has one, two, three, four pieces attacking d5. So white has to do something with his pawn. Pawn takes e6, and now after f takes e6, I think it's clear black's opening has been a triumph. All of black's pieces working very well, and black won very quickly in the game. The game continued. Bishop e2. And now queen g6, a clever little idea, pressurizing g2. Knight to h4, and Tony now moved his queen to h6. Really crazy chess, but actually, if you think about it, it's quite logical. We're attacking the knight now. Bishop to f3, trying to exchange off this strong bishop on b7. Black, of course, just developed. And now g3, a typical move for the English defense, g5. Here comes Gary the g-pawn. And now after e4, white tries to pin the pawn, but black's knight came into e5. And it's clear here, all of black's pieces are swarming into the attack. The game finished, bishop g2, queen g7, threatening the knight on h4. f4, Tony took on h4. And after pawn takes e5, knight to g4. And real problems here for white, black can always castle queenside. Where does white put his king? If white tries to castle king's side, bishop c5 check is coming in. And knight to f2 check. White's king will not last another day. So this crazy idea, let's go back to the start of playing d4, e6. And now you only go b6 generally after c4. If white pushes ahead with d5, bishop b7 is playable, but it doesn't make as much sense now because you're not really fretting anything. But queen to h4, Tony's idea of going queen to h4 and then queen to h5, pressurizing d5, becomes a very solid possibility. Now, his game against, I have to show you his game against Karpov because that was very interesting. That continued knight to c3. Now, taking on c4 here is very risky because white would go e4 and gain a lot of tempo. Tony instead just developed bishop to b4. And he got a very good game against Karpov very quickly. Karpov broke the pin, bishop d2. And now we see this knight to f6 move again, pressurizing d5 and ideas.
to the highways Till my shadow turns to sun rays And on and on we'll go Through the wastelands, through the highways And on A knight to e4. e3, Tony took on c3 so that his knight could come to e4, threatening checkmate on f2. Queen c2, Tony got rid of the bishop on c3, and now he simply castled kingside. And after g3, he put his queen on e4 here, a much better square, and the queen dropped back to g6. And again, it's this hyper-modern idea. In these positions, you attack the centre, bishop b7. And he gained this equal position against Karpov. So I think a very successful opening. So I really like this idea in the opening. If your opponent pushes forwards with d5 in a number of positions, well, especially this position, you can consider the idea queen to h4. Now, when else can white play the move d5? What other positions do we have to consider? Well, Another move we have to look at is the line with knight to c3, where white actually delays going e4. And I mentioned this before, where white doesn't actually give you this target on e4 to attack. So what should we do in these setups? Well, we should go bishop to b7, stage one first. And now, given a chance, what I'd like to do anyway, whether, whether white goes e4 or not, I still, in these setups, I always like going bishop to b4 and f5 anyway. So if white doesn't put the pawn on e4, I'd say go bishop to b4 if you can and f5 anyway. And then knight to f6 and knight to e4 becomes a, a main idea if white doesn't play e4. Now, what if white plays a3, which I've faced a number of times, stopping bishop to b4? Well, we can't do bishop to b4 now, so let's just use our normal crowbar move, f5. And what we want to do here now is go knight to f6 and knight to e4 quickly. Where should our bishop on f8 go? This is the next question you should ask yourself. It can't go to b4 anymore. Well, in actual fact, a bishop can come to f6 often. A lovely diagonal. And if white tries to play d5 in these positions, now queen to h4 doesn't make as much sense here because our pawn is on f5 and this has weakened us. So I'd only go queen to h4 when white goes d5 if our pawn is back on f7. In these positions, when our pawn is on f5 and our opponent goes d5, a rule to remember is to try to get your dark square bishop first to f6. So when white plays d5, if we can get our dark square bishop to the h8 a1 diagonal, look at that diagonal. It's a beautifully opened diagonal for that bishop. We will get a good game. I was playing ex-women's, I believe, world champion Peng from Holland. And that continued bishop to e7, g3, bishop f6, lovely square for my bishop. One of my bishops is not so great, but my other bishop now becomes good. Bishop d2, knight e7, bishop g2. This pawn on d5 is pinned. My opponent can't move that pawn. Castles, knight to h3. And now it's a more manoeuvring game here. I have to admit to that, but I came up with a good maneuver in this game. Knight to c8. Castles, knight to d6, attacking the pawn on b3. And after b3, I've only got one piece, which is a problem. My knight on b8. And I brought this knight into the game with one important idea in mind. I want to get a knight to the e4 square. And this combined with my bishop on f6 gave me a beautiful position and I ended up winning the game. So... A bit more positional, this, these ideas. A bit more tricky when white doesn't put on pawn on e4. But if I, as I said before, and we'll see in the next video, if white doesn't go pawn to e4, then we should try to go bishop to b4 anyway and f5. When we can decide upon ideas, but it's mainly about the e4 square in those particular variations. Now, really, I think that's pretty much most things we're going to discuss in this video here. This d5 move, 
is something you will face at certain points. And these videos, you, you have, I would recommend you watch them a couple of times each. And whenever you face these ideas in a game, you're going to have to try to remember and work out whether it's the right stage to play queen to h4 or another idea. Now, the rule was if your pawn's on f7 and white goes d5, well, then queen to h4 is very strong. And you just have to work this out during the game. So you're playing in your opening. Do not rush your moves. Just take your time in the opening, and then hopefully you will come through and find the right variations. But I think, I hope you agree, there's some very interesting ideas with this queen coming out to h4, these ideas here. And we've seen this time and time again in this type of opening. So um, that's all we're going to look at now in this video. And in the next video, we'll have a look at some other possibilities that white may try. And that will really cover you for pretty much everything you will face in the English defence. Everything that's important anyway. Welcome to the last video in this mini-series on the English defence, this uh, exciting opening that we've been looking at where black goes e6 and b6 at the correct moment. Um, so called the English defence because it's been named after um, a number of English grandmasters, Tony Miles most notably, but also Raymond Keane, Spielman, Julian Hodson, um, myself, I've played this on a regular basis. So. It's really a number of English players made this popular. But if you look through history and look at other players that played this opening, you can include the likes of Spassky, nowadays Jabava, um, Nigel Short um, is another player. Lots of top players have used this opening. And in this last video, we're just going to have a look at other things you may encounter. And this is when we're not necessarily look at white playing e4, the most critical move. So I just want to make sure you're not going to be tricked out in the opening. And, I, and there are a couple of points that might be a little bit annoying for us in this opening that we need to deal with. And OK, well, let's go into the action. So obviously, I wouldn't recommend you play the English defence against e4. And I've spoke about this before and reasoning why I um, I don't recommend you play this setup against e4. I generally like having my pawn on b6 only when white has a pawn on c4. Look back at my previous videos to see why. So d4, I will start with e6. And again here, to give you a full repertoire, what I'd recommend you do is prepare yourself for the French defence. And the next set of videos I'm going to do will be on the French defence. And then you'll be fully prepared. And also check out some of my videos on the Dutch opening because there are times when that would be useful for this move order. Now, what happens if white does not play 2c4 here? Well, this is a good question, and there are two moves which can be a little bit annoying to us, and those moves are the moves g3 and the move knight to f3. Now, the problem with g3 is that if we go b6, we're obviously going to get targeted very quickly on the long diagonal. So this doesn't really seem to work too well for us, b6. So after the move g3, I'm going to give you two recommended ways of playing. I say you either learn the Dutch defence, and you can check my videos out on this, because I'll be honest, g3 is a very rare move. Or if you want to try to take advantage of your opponent not playing a pawn move in the centre of the board, you can try to strike out with the move c5. And this would probably be my recommended way of playing because g3 is not a common move. And to take advantage of the fact that white hasn't played a move in the center, we can strike out with c5. And the point being, if white plays a move like knight to f3, we can strike out, first of all, with knight to c6. And then we can just play simple moves 
like d5 and gain this space in the center of the board. So against g3, in the sky gazing far into the night i raise my hand to the fire but it's no use because you can't stop it from shining through it's true baby let the light shine through if you believe it's true baby won't you let the light I recommend you check out the move to c5 and then you'll be pretty much out of main theoretical lines already. Now what about knight to f3? I mean I'll be honest this is another slightly annoying move for our opening because if you want to try to play the English defense my recommended way of playing was you only play b6 when white goes c4. So it's all about the move order here. I mean I've played b6 a number of times here this has been one of my main options here. But now white should play e4. And we get now a hippopotamus opening, an opening I discussed in a video a couple of videos ago, where we can go bishop to b7. Our opponent defends the pawn on e4. But this is a little bit indifferent to the English defense because white's pawn is still on c2. And now stage two, the English defense, bishop to b4 check, does not work so successful here because of c3. And there's two ways you can play this position. Now, number one way is to play the hippopotamus, a very easy opening to learn. And there was a game, Aronian versus Luke and Shane from England, where Luke played g6. And the point of this setup is to fianchetto both bishops, put both of your knights in front of your king and queen, and keep things very flexible. For example, the game Aronian played normal moves, rook e1, and here we see Luke going for the so-called hippopotamus setup. And this here is the hippopotamus, this setup you see here from black. And it's a very solid opening. Normally you want to try to play the move f5 later on, once you've castled, or even e5. And it's something that you might be comfortable playing, you may not be comfortable playing. Give this a go in some practice games first. I like this setup and I'm quite happy playing the setup, but other people might think it's a little bit too cramped for black. So that's option one. 
Now option two, after the move knight to f3, is to play b6, e4, bishop to b7, bishop to d3, and now to strike out against the centre as quickly as you can. And Tony Mars was a fan of the move c5 here. And he had a couple of games. I mean, one game he played went c3. And here, Tony always tried to now attack the e4 pawn with his knight. So he did simple development, trying to pressurise this pawn. And the idea is, if white pushes on with e5, our knight comes into d5 and sits on that square. And if white tries to keep the centre closed down, Tony finished bishop e7, so simply developed. And after castles, he brought his other knight out. And he played this very flexible setup here where he's got a little bit more space. He wants in this position to take on d4 and then go knight to b4 if white's not careful. Let's say white plays a move like bishop to e3. Well, now Tony wants to take on d4 and go knight to b4. And this is his main threat. This is a very nice position for black because you are threatening the pawn on e4. You want to get rid of your opponent's bishop. And your English defence bishop on b7 is a very good piece. So Tony was quite a big fan of this type of sort of development. And you have these two choices if you want to stick to the English defence pure after the crafty move order knight to f3. Now, the reason at the start I said, you know, this might not be up your street is that I often in this move or personally play f5 and go into a Dutch opening which there are videos on here you can look at as well if you're not happy with the English defence. So these are all crafty move order options, and they're quite hard, I, I admit, for beginners to grasp, but you will get used to them. You just have to think very slowly at the start of the game and adjust quickly to the way that your opponent's playing. Now, what else can be played after e6 here? What other move order things do we have to look out for? Well, let's say white does go c4. Well, now b6 is clearly the recommended move. And we are now going to look at positions where white doesn't go e4 in this, and he doesn't necessarily go d5. So, for example, something like knight to f3. Well, we do stage one, bishop to b7, and we now go for the following plan, bishop b4 and f5 anyway. It makes a lot of sense if white's not going to go e4, to develop the bishop on f1 to g2, so g3. And now a good plan here, stage two, bishop to b4, check. And there's a couple of ways we can, black can play this now, after something like bishop to d2. Well, I recommend we get rid of those bishops. And here, what is our crowbar move? We have to strike out, get control of the all-important e4 square, f5. And now after some normal developing moves, knight to f6, both sides castle. We have good control of this square on e4 now. And after a move like queen to c2, this is a middle game position now. So this is why looking at my Dutch videos will help you learn more about this opening as well, because this does resemble a Dutch opening, except we have our bishop on b7, which can be quite handy for us. And here, a typical idea in a Dutch opening is queen to e8. I really like this maneuver. Try to get the queen to h5, to start an attack against the white king. After something like rook to e1, bring that queen into the game, queen to h5, and black is already starting to attack in this position with ideas of knight to g4 at some point, even g5, even f5, attack, attack, attack. So let's just go through that again. So this is with knight to f3. We play the move bishop to b7 after that, and now g3, stage two, we check on b4. Now, what else can white block with here? Well, he can block with a knight. He can also block maybe knight to c3. And now we go for our hold on the e4 square. So we should play f5 as always. And after bishop g2, knight to f6, now white castles. Now, as soon as white castles, I think this is an important time to have a little think because I always play bishop takes c3 here. Now that white can move his knight somewhere, I mean, white can move this knight if he wishes away, and then we won't be able to double his pawn. So when the timing comes, when that position comes where he might be able to move his knight, I always take the knight off the board because this increases my control of the e4 square. 
And all these variations where white doesn't put a pawn on e4, it's about us, black, controlling that e4 square. And if you like, in the whole of the English defence, it's all about the e4 square. So by giving up our dark square bishop for the knight on c3, we increase our control of that square. And now a very important move. After b takes c3, what should you you be playing here. Have a little think about this position and this is a key idea in this particular position here. It's about this e4 square. Now what would you play in this position and I'll give you a clue one of your pieces should go to that square. Which piece should it be? Well I believe as soon as, soon as you've got rid of the knight on c4 As soon as that knight is not controlling e4 anymore, I always put my bishop upon that square. Why do I do that? Well, I'm a little bit afraid in some variations, if we castle, first of all, that white might play the move d5. This is a move to watch out for. So beware of the move d5 when both sides have fianchetto like this. Because if you take on d5, White can often play knight takes d4, knight to d4, and white is the one with a pin on the d5 pawn, and these positions get a little bit tricky. I want to stop all of these ideas by playing my bishop to e4 first. So the move d5 now from white makes little sense because our bishop is not going to be trapped in anymore. If white ever moves the knight on f3, well, we can swap off light square bishops, and here we can continue simply with our ideas of castles, queen e8, queen h5 with some kind of attack. Now, I always put my bishop on e4 or not my knight. Why is that? Well, the problem is, again, to do with this kind of bishop on g2. If we put our knight on e4, it can often become in a nasty pin. Not here, because knight takes c3 is a ploy that we're trying to use. But after something like queen c2, let's say black castles, you have to watch out for the dangerous move, knight to d2. And now look at the pressure white has with the piece on e4. This knight on e4 will struggle to move, and indeed you could end up in a very bad position quickly here. So I don't like playing in this manner. So a key point is, if you get your bishop b4 check in in these lines, and white has fianchettoed his kingside, if white replies with knight to c3, then we should take that knight at some point, continue with f5, and plonk our bishop onto 
this very, very nice square in the center of the board. So that's my, my way of playing this. So let's just have a look other setups again. So there's a lot to take in here. I mean, it was a game, uh, Spielman, where this actually occurred um, in a Spielman game. So let's just see how Spielman played this with black. And that continued, knight to c3 now. So white didn't play g3 first. Again, it's flexible move orders. We do our stage two now. We go bishop to b4. And here, instead of fianchettoing, we've seen what we should do against that, white decided to play e3. So white wants to put his bishop on d3. So does this make any difference? Well, in actual fact, I think this is a much superior setup for black now. And what should we always do when white does not go e4? We have to try to gain maximum control of the e4 square. f5, correct way to play. White played bishop to d3. Knight to f6, increasing our control over that square. White castled. Now, in actual fact, if this was me here, I would have stuck to the rule I told you about before. Now that white has castled, the knight on c3 may move, and I would have played bishop takes c3 in this position. But Spielman instead castled first, and now after bishop d2, he took on c3 here, which doesn't allow the doubling of pawns, but it still has the same idea to keep control of the e4 square. And now again, I'm going to give you your second question. What piece should you put on e4? And it's slightly different now. Before, I said we shouldn't put the knight on e4. Why did I say you shouldn't put the knight on e4? Well, my reasoning was if your knight goes to e4 when white has a fianchetto bishop on g2, the knight on e4 can become in a nasty pin. Now, clearly that is not the case here because white hasn't fianchetto the, the pawn on g3. So... In these positions where white hasn't fianchetto, we don't have to fear a pin on the h1a8 diagonal. So I think we should go knight to e4. And this is the way I like playing these positions. And the game continues. Spillman's game after knight to e4. Queen to e2. A couple of ideas here. If you want to be really um, brave, you could even go for the rook swing. Rook f6, rook to g6, rook to h6 and try to attack like this. I've used this idea on many occasions when I have a pawn on f5. Spielman preferred to develop his pieces in a sensible manner. In these variations, your knight on b8 can be a problem piece. I'd always recommend, if you can play it, to go d6 and knight d7. When you develop your pieces, always try to think where they're best placed. Now, I wouldn't necessarily want to put it on c6 because it blocks my bishop on b7 in. So Spielman continued d6. Knight d2 was played, trying to take control of the e4 square. Spielman just went knight d7 anyway. f3, he took on c3, and now he went e5, gaining space in the centre of the board. e4 is not, a, not something we've got control of, but we are pushing forwards with e5. White has double pawns. Black was slightly better in this structure, and this is a very, very comfortable position for black here. Very comfortable position for black. Better for black. Um, okay, so really, they're the main ideas that we should bear in mind in a lot of these positions when white plays in this manner. So this is after d4, e6, c4, b6, and white doesn't play the move e4. So we still do our same plan, but it's about controlling this e4 square. Now, just to give you kind of as much of an overview of this opening as I can... I should also mention, what happens if white plays the English opening? Can you still do the same thing? Well, yes, of course you can. Against the English opening, when white goes c4, you can play b6 immediately. And now, what happens if white tries to avoid playing d4, for example? Well, let, let's just stick with our standard strategy. Remember, our three, main three-point plan is bishop to b7. If we can go bishop to b4, bishop to b4, and then, often... The move f5 when we can play f5. So, for example, let's see this in action. Knight to c3, bishop b7. And now, well, we've looked at ideas with d4. We go e6. And if white plays e4, well, we still go e6. And I had one game where I played as white. I had this with white. I played bishop to d3 here. I mean, again, if something like g3, 
we could either go f5 immediately here, and this is looking very comfortable for us. Bishop g2, let's increase the pressure on e4. And I played f5 first because it's created a threat immediately, but at the right moment, I will play bishop to b4 and increase the pressure on e4. Now, I had this as white against Julian Hodson. Let's just take a look at that game to finish off this segment on ideas you can use when white doesn't put his free pawns in the center. Now, Julian Hodson is, well, he's now kind of retired from competitive chess. He was a very exciting player, Julian Hodson. 2640, 2650, very attacking player, famous English player. And he, he was yet another generation of players who used this opening to great effect. And I tried a very strange setup with bishop to d3 against him. So in this position, let's think logically and give you a little bit of a test, okay? So over the course of the videos, I've given you ideas of what you should be playing. And it's not all about memorizing what you should do in certain positions. It's more about the ideas you should be playing. And if you can remember those main ideas, you should be able to put them into action when you play this opening in different situations. And for example, this position here could be a situation where you don't know the theory. So what should you play? Well, remember I said plan one was put the bishop on b7. Plan two was to put the bishop on b4. And now after something like knight on ge2, you could try f5 straight away. But then things can get quite messy after e takes f5. Julian, first of all, simply played knight to e7. Because he still wants to go f5, but when he plays this move, he wants to have the option of taking back on f5 with a piece or a pawn. Um, I play bishop to c2 against Julian, trying to play my pawn to d4 next, and now f5. So here we go. See, logical play in action. Julian understood the ideas that he should be playing, so he played them. The crowbar move. The game continued castled. Julian castled. d4. And now... As we'll often see, you often should consider taking on c3 in these types of positions. And the bishop on b4 is not doing a great deal, so my opponent took on c3. This forces knight takes c3 in order to guard e4. And now my opponent swap plans. He realized that he doesn't actually have too many threats against e4 here. So he played a very interesting plan, f4. And he used this pawn to attack me now. I try to attack him. Didn't quite work, though. Queen g4. Knight g6. Knight to e2. I'm trying to win the pawn on f4, but now e5. And my position got very bad very quickly. So I have to admit, the, the lines and variations in this video are a little bit more confusing than we've look, looked at previously. So let's just go back to start, have an overview for the ideas you should be thinking if faced with something you're not sure about. Now, my rule one is really, you should wait until white plays c4 to play b6, but there are times when that's not possible. And your opponent can try to trick you in the move order here by playing g3. And if your opponent ever gets g3 in first, b6 makes little sense, but he hasn't played a move in the center of the board. So now I think a good response is c5, trying to take advantage of that. So we strike in the center now, because our typical English defense ideas don't work so well. If our opponent plays knight to f3, well, he hasn't played c4, so it's a very crafty move order idea, this. So b6 is okay, and you can play in the manners we spoke about, but it's not as effective in other lines. So you can play this way, and we talked a little bit about this, or if you want to, you can try the Dutch defence, and this might fit in very well to what we discussed. And one way you could try to play this is by going f5, and then playing b6 next and bishop b7, and that might get you into positions you're more comfortable with. So what if white plays c4 anyway, and after b6, he doesn't go e4? Well, if white doesn't play e4 in these positions, your plan is the same. Bishop b7, bishop b4 check, f5, when we are aiming to take control of the e4 square. And the only thing you have to think of is later on, do you aim to put your bishop on e4 or your knight on e4? If white fianchettos his kingside bishop, you always put your bishop on e4 after an exchange of the knight on b1. You don't want this knight on b1 taking your bishop. You have to exchange that knight off the board. 
If your opponent puts his light square bishop on f1, on e2 or d3, generally, after you've played your moves, bishop b7, bishop b4, you want to put your knight on e4. Now, I know this is quite a complicated overview. I've hoped the ideas I've shown in this video have sort of shown you when these ideas are playable. Of course, when you're playing your natural games, it's actually, in my opinion, a good thing to think from an early stage. So many people nowadays, they learn what moves they should do against certain options of their opponent, and they don't think in a proper way. They play their moves without any thoughts behind them. When you're playing openings like this, I think they're really good for your chess because you have to think you have to think logically. You have to think in more chess terms. You have to think outside the box and you have to be flexible. So all in all, I think this opening will help you improve your chess. And I think you can get some very exciting positions from it. But remember, you have to be flexible and you have to adjust to the setup the white plays. And that does conclude our videos here on the English defence. I really hope they come in handy for you. I wish you the best of luck playing them. Um, I wish you, I hope you get some great victories, not too many horrible defeats. We do all get them occasionally, but I hope you get some great victories with it. And most importantly, I hope you enjoyed the videos and they're useful to you. So thank you for now. My next set of videos should be on the French defence, which, as we discussed before, fits in very well with the move order we're using here. To the night, I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through, it's true, baby let the light shine through, if you believe it's true, baby won't you let the light My own world of make-believe Kids screaming in the cradles Profanities I see the world through ice covered in ink and bleach Cross out the ones who heard my cries And watch me weep I love everything Fire spreading all around my room my world's so bright, it's hard to breathe, but that's alright Hush Take my eyes open to force you
reality Why can't you just let me eat my weight in glee I live inside my own world of make-believe Kids screaming in their cradles, profanities Some days I feel skinnier than all the other days Sometimes I can't tell if my body belongs to me I love everything Fire spreading all around my room My world's so bright, it's hard to breathe But that's alright Hush Thank you.